Good afternoon. Welcome to another daily devotion. This is episode 248. We're almost at 250, which is exciting. My name's Logan Hargort, and here we just love to open up God's Word for 15 minutes and see, see what He has to say for another day. We're going to be turning through to Matthew chapter 26 today and thinking about the Garden of Gethsemane. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me through to chapter 26, and I will just start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which is rich and true, and we pray that you would bless it to us. Use it to nourish us and feed us, that we might know your word and love you all the more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Well, in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's, a, it's quite a disturbing passage, isn't it? Disturbing not in the sense that it reveals something ugly, but disturbing in the sense that it reveals something of our Jesus I don't think we would really expect had it not been written. When we think about Jesus, I think we tend to think of him as the, the superhero, the superman, one whom the Pharisees could not contend with, one whom was strong, one who could fight for the lowly. And yet here we see him, quite different than we have in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. Here we see a sorrowed and troubled Jesus. Matthew tells us in verse 37 that he takes Peter, James and John with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. The word for troubled is the, is the idea of, of inner turmoil. It's as though the the inner inner person of Jesus, his inner humanity, you know that that part within you which which you consider to be the real you. It's as if that part is all is all twisted up inside of Christ. As he as he looks and thinks of the reality of what is about to happen, as he thinks about the road that is before him, his inner person is all twisted and sorrowful, filled with gloom and sadness at the prospects of his road. Verse 38, he says, My soul is very sorrowful. even to death. I wonder if you've ever been that sorrowful before. If you've ever felt so sorrowful that 
you've thought to yourself, I could die, I am so sad. I'm sure some of you have felt that way. Most, most of us have not, but some of us have. Some of us have faced such a blackness and darkness of the soul that we've, that we've been prepared to say with Job, it would be better had I never been born. Here is our Jesus. And you know the glorious thing about that? Hebrews tells us that Jesus is a great high priest who can sympathize with us in our weakness. If you've experienced or if you are experiencing a blackness of the soul, let me tell you, you are not alone. You are not alone. Jesus is there. Jesus knows. Jesus can sympathize with you. He knows what it's like to experience that. We have a great high priest in heaven who can sympathize with us in our weakness and give us help in our time of need. Is your soul weary and troubled? Remember the way the song goes? Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? What's the chorus? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Why? Because he's there to help us. He's there to heal us. But notice... Notice not just the state of the soul of Jesus. Notice what Jesus does. His response. Verse 39. Going a little farther, he prayed. 42. For a second time, he went and prayed. Verse 44. Leaving them, he went away and prayed. For the third time. But notice who he prayed to. His response was to pray to my father, verse 39, my father, verse 42, and verse 44, saying the same words again, my father. You see, Jesus, first and foremost, knew that he was a son and that he had a father in heaven who he could pray to. And this is a, this is a very important thing to us to recognize. Jesus, although he was the son of God, was not some superior human being who could just ignore the sorrows of his heart, but he came and brought them to his Father in heaven. And how much more, you and I, when we face the dark night of our souls, should our response not also be to flee to our Father in heaven, a Father who loves us, a Father who who delights to hear our prayers. You see, Jesus is not just the great high priest, but he's also an example for us, isn't he? And he highlights for us what we should do. But notice the particular plea that Jesus brings up. He prays in verse 39 that if it was possible, the cup would be taken away. In verse 42, he prays the same thing, and yet he adds to both, your will be done. There's a legitimate plea from the mouth of Jesus here that if it's possible for God's children to be saved without the crucifixion of Jesus, without the wrath of God being heaped upon Jesus, if there's a way to do that, that God would please do it. Don't hear that in a fake, trite manner, as if Jesus prays how we pray sometimes, where we say, oh, you know, can you do this? But if, you know, what, just do your will. He is legitimately asking that. Jesus is legitimately praying, Father, if you can, take it away. He is bold in his prayer. And yet, he is boldest in his trust in his Father's will. So your will be done. Because Jesus Christ knows as the Son of God and the Lord of glory, he knows that his Father's will is the best will. And Jesus will not take matters into his own hands. And so what happens? 
Jesus is sorrowful. He is troubled. He comes to his father. He makes his plea known. He commits himself to his father's will. And then his strength is resolved, isn't it? Verse 46. Rise. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The father meets him in his darkest hour. He doesn't give Jesus what he wants in the sense of another cup. But he gives him what is best, doesn't he? It's as though the father says to him, my son, there is only one way. So let my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that great prayer that Jesus taught us to pray is uttered and answered. It's a glorious picture of Jesus, isn't it? The trust in which he commits himself into his father's care. The, the belief that he has in his father who does what is right. And I think it highlights for us one very, very important thing. Jesus went through this so that we don't have we may have dark nights of the soul, but we never go towards the cross. We may be crucified, but we never go towards the cross. We may suffer many things, but we never drink the cup of God's wrath if we are God's children. You see, ultimately, this is highlighting for us not what we must do, but what Christ has done. You see, he accomplished, he won, he succeeded at the Garden of Gethsemane with his father so that you and I don't have to. And because he's succeeded, now, now you and I can also come to our father. You and I can also come to our God in heaven with the same plea. God help me. Father help me. Be with me. I so desperately need your help. And just as Jesus was heard, so you and I will be heard too. And so I wonder, have you ever prayed like this? But most of all, I wonder, have you come to trust the Lord of the Garden of Gethsemane? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we pray that you would take it and press it into our hearts, cause it to overflow, that we might worship you truly. Thank you for the magnificence of Jesus in the garden, filled with sorrow, trusting in you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining me for another daily devotion. See you back here for episode 249 tomorrow afternoon. Have a most blessed night.